to get the microphone going. Hi, my name is Abby, and I uh, I really wish colleges still did that whole uh, scholastic book fair thing in elementary school. I could really use another Clifford the Big Red Dog book right about now. I feel like I read a lot when I was a kid, like a lot, uh, for fun, too. Um, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, because if the internet's done anything, it's taught us that none of us have universally unique experiences, uh, apparently. So I know I'm not the only one out there who can relate to um, scrambling to shut the book and the phone light off when my parents came to check if I was asleep. Uh, and then I went into high school, uh, around the same time Netflix was making the switch from red envelopes in the mail to the world's best-known online streaming service. Uh, <laughs> once that became popular, I really didn't read anything unless I had to for school. Uh, and it was super uncool to read anyway. <laughs> it was much cooler to talk to my friends about, you know, TV or movies that were coming out. Uh, and I think when you're 11 or 13 or even 16, um, it's really easy to just dismiss reading completely because everything you read in class is presented as required learning and everything else you're just too, you know, tired or busy for. Um, by the time you're done with your day, all you really want to do is relax and, you know, watch some TV. Uh, and reading becomes this chore that feels like it'd take a lot of effort to do. Also, when I, when I was in high school, I did smoke a lot of weed. Uh, and that makes it kind of hard to retain information. Um, but now, at the risk of sounding uh, both like a bookworm and like one of those people who thinks that being a bookworm makes them better than everyone else, uh, I've sort of rediscovered what I believe is the same love I had for books when I was young, just kind of updated uh, to fit the perspective I've gained from, you know, being in life and living. Um, and what I found above all is that like the stories I read when I'm young are just not the same stories that I've read when I turn 21, I guess. When you go back to these books and novels that, you know, your mom recited to you as a kid or you read a chapter from on the way home from school every day, um, you'll find there's messages waiting for you to kind of discover and apply them to your life and development um, and what feels like very much actively growing up. Romeo and Juliet uh, is no longer this stupid moral love fable about two dumb teenagers too naive for the real world. Uh, it's a really sad story about two young soulmates facing this useless feud completely out of their control. And no matter how much they try to preserve their love, it only ends in more pain and hatred and violence and ultimately the death of two protagonists and more characters. The feud does end, but with a family line without a family lineage to continue the peace, the story ends in complete tragedy and serves as a guideline for questioning traditional views of your culture. Uh, love is supposed to conquer all in that story, but from the way it's treated in that society, it was defeated by jealousy and hatred for no reason. Romeo and Juliet then transforms from this dumb, uh, required eighth grade English class reading to this more kind of signpost for your own romantic life in a way. Not that you're going to find your Romeo or Juliet tomorrow, but maybe you'll gain a little bit of knowledge about how your own views and your own society uh, are set up and consequences that can arise from them uh, if they're not dealt with. Maybe it sounds, I don't know, sort of dumb, but reading is great, I think, because it takes a long time to realize that nobody is alone in their thoughts in the world. Uh, which is a statement that could really be taken a million different ways. <laughs> One of my favorite examples is, um, I think it's remarkable that Mary Wollstonecraft can write in 1759, um, taught from infancy that beauty is women's scepter, the mind shapes itself to the body, and roaming around its gilt cage only seeks to adorn its prison. And I know exactly what she's talking about 260 years later, uh, when I'm still fiddling with how my hair looks in the mirror. Uh, rather than, you know, breaking out of the prison and not giving a crap at all. Reading is comforting in that manner. Uh, it lets us know that there are hundreds, if not thousands, uh, like us who do feel the same point at some time in our life and decide to write a book about it. We get to read that book. I didn't read as much in high school in the first year of college until I came across a book I had read years before, and it was so relatable to my own life at that point that I almost was actually crying when I finished last page. Uh, at points, it felt like the author had recorded bits of my life and put them straight into the pages. It was uh, The Rules of Attraction by Brent Easton Ellis, if anyone's interested. That's the greatest thing, though, because reading kind of lets you pretend until the cows come home that maybe somehow you could have done something differently or fantasize about what you could do if what's happening in the pages starts to happen to you. We practice and hone our reactions and emotions 
through reading simply because it's one of the purest and simplest forms of human expression. Movies tell us when to react and where to react and how to react, but books let us flex our imaginations uh, to anything we really want without restriction. So that permission of imagination and creativity that books give you is just so essential to life uh, living, I think. People write about what they know, and it's pretty much as simple as that. People know a lot of things. <laughs> Different people know a lot of things. And reading opens the gates to so much of that. And I'm not really trying to say here, like, oh, go pick up a book and educate yourself. I'm just saying that maybe we shouldn't be so quick to dismiss reading as this tedious and arduous activity because, you know, maybe that's what they want us to think. So basically, in trying to keep reading for fun, I've been trying to finish a few books per month in, in addition to what I'm reading for school. Uh, and I'm going to try and make videos reviewing those books so I can you know, moderate myself and make sure I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm always looking for more suggestions as well as, you know, discussion topics for these, this type of stuff. So if you want to leave a comment, that would be great. Uh, you know, whatever. Uh, I'm going to start with a few more kind of philosophical works and more than fictional ones or fantasy. But, I, you know, I love fantasy. I love horror. I love every kind of novel that's out there pretty much. Uh, every kind of work. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't really know where I'm going with this, but yeah, send me some books. Today, I just have two books. The first one is um, Why I Write by George Orwell. And the second one, today I only have two books. The first one is Why I Write by George Orwell. And the second book is actually a response to that book. Um, entitled Things I Don't Want to Know by Deborah Levy. I guess the best place to start is uh, an essay about why I write it all. Uh, and this is a pretty short one too. So most people know George Orwell as the author of 1984 and Animal Farm, in which he creates dystopian and bestial versions and exaggerated realities about real life political systems. Um, while his two most famous works are fictional, his lesser known collection of essays, essays titled Why I Write uh, are Orwell's official stance on writing, why he does it, and what sorts of implications political writing has in 20th century Britain based on what he observed through his own influence and experiences. The short book was written in 1945 and uh, was published in 1946, right when World War II ended. The collection begins with his recollection of his childhood and how he excelled in his school when he was younger at writing and reading but kind of felt pressure towards it when he entered his 20s and started writing for literary magazines. Uh, he gave up writing multiple times in his life, but some part of him kind of felt that he knew he would always have to be a writer. Um, the rest of the essays are kind of Orwell answering this really interesting question of how has language and the way in which writers use language evolved to fit political narratives, and how can we moderate this type of influence? <laughs> Stick with me here. Orwell first lays out the four motives of each writer, sheer egoism, aesthetic enthusiasm, historical impulse, and political impulse. He argues that all writers are pretty narcissistic and kind of have an unavoidable bias. Uh, work by a writer is a reflection of how smart he thinks he is, uh, what he thinks will please the general public to some extent, and a personal critique to both the history and political environment of how a given situation in society came to be. Having seen for himself the rise of fascism in Nazi Germany and the subsequent rising popularities of totalitarianism, socialism, and other ideologies, uh, he defines those ideologies in a clear light as well as the ways in which they've been manipulated to fit an ulterior motive of a given political party. He ends this collection with an analysis of the political use of words in pol politics and the English language. Uh, this was my favorite part to read, actually, because it kind of took me the longest to understand uh, but Orwell's prose and explanations kind of deliver a really great summary of how some words just don't really mean anything. For example, words like romantic, plastic, values, human, dead, sentimental, natural, vitality, as used in art criticism, are strictly meaningless in the sense that they not only do not point to any discoverable object, but are hardly ever expected to do so by the reader. When one critic writes, the outstanding feature of Mr. X's work is its living quality, while another writes, the immediately striking thing about Mr. X's work is its peculiar deadness. The reader accepts this as a simple difference opinion. If words like black and white were involved, instead of the jargon words dead and living, 
he would see at once that language was being used in an improper way. Many political words are similarly abused. The word fascism has now no meaning except so far as it signifies something not desirable. The words democracy, socialism, freedom, patriotic, realistic, justice have each of them several different meanings which cannot be reconciled with one another. In the case of a word like democracy, not only is there no agreed definition, but the attempt to make one is resisted from all sides. It is almost universally felt that when we call a country democratic, we are praising it. Consequently, the defenders of every kind of regime claim that it is a democracy and fear that they might have to stop using that word if it were tied down to any one meaning. Words of this kind are often used in a consciously dishonest way. That is, the person who uses them has his own private definition, but allows his hearer to think he means something quite different. I'll let you, I'll let you ball on that a little. I'll see if you can come up with any of your own uh, modern examples. <laughs> Uh, overall, the essays are a bit hard to get through because the book is structured assuming that you understand a lot of huge words as well as exactly what's happening uh, in each part as the sections kind of all build on each other. Uh, but definitely worth a read if you ever feel like being the guy at a party who brings up an Orwellian concept that's not from 1984. The second book I especially enjoyed uh, because it was actually written as a response to why I write. Uh, Deborah Levy published Things I Don't Want to Know in 2013, and although each chapter is an extension of the four motives that are presented in Orwell's essays, the book is wildly different in that it touches on the experience of being a female writer. Uh, Levy's book has a smoother feel to it than Orwell's because it's more of a personal account than analysis, and the author pauses frequently in the book to ask questions that are posed to both herself and supposedly her audience. It begins with this author traveling to Majorca alone to deal with her writer's block and pondering this sort of midlife crisis. Uh, the first part of the book is just instantly relatable and feels like it invites you to this really intimate part of someone's life right away. That spring when life was very hard and I was at war with my lot and simply couldn't see where there was to get to, I seemed to cry mostly on escalators at train stations. It was as if the momentum of the escalator carrying me forwards and upwards was a physical conversation I was having with myself. Escalators which in the early days of their invention were known as traveling staircases or magic stairways, had mysteriously become danger zones. I made a decision. If escalators had become machines with torrid emotionality, a system that transported me to places I did not want to go, why not book a flight to somewhere I actually did want to go? Responding to the political impulse presented in Orwell's essay, she views motherhood as this institution fathered by masculine consciousness. Again, stick with me. Uh, what she means is that men with careers in writing or art or anything uh, who also have children aren't really expected to take care of them or love them publicly or make loving them part of their image, whereas women are expected to sacrifice anything, especially their silly little careers, for their children, blindly. In turn, this puts emotional pressure on women who are only seen as mothers once they bear a child, painfully aware of their own presence on their daughter. Even the most arrogant female writer has to work overtime to build an ego that is robust enough to get her through January, never mind all the way to December. The suburb of femininity is not a good place to live, nor is it wise to seek refuge inside our children, because children are always keen to make their way into the world to meet someone else. Yes, there had been many times I called my daughters back to zip up their coats. All the same, I knew they would rather be cold and free. Later on, she goes to talk about her experience growing up in apartheid South Africa. She recounts watching her own father being taken to prison, and in the four years he is away, her experience in a segregated school. What's pretty cool, too, is that while Levy is white herself, she talks about racism in South Africa that doesn't speak in place of Black experience, but rather as an observer of them through the eyes of an eight-year-old. Through a narrative of a gradual understanding of something to do with not feeling safe with people who are supposed to be safe, this she recounts sexual harassment from her own principal and sensing that adults were contributing to the reasons that white children were scared of black children from a very young age. Uh, throughout even the most harrowing of her experiences, Levy maintains this sense of stylistic writing that just fits me right into the narrative, uh, as if you're there kind of watching it all happen with her. She finds poetic ways of describing really complex political situations such as family culture and segregation. He said every time I sprinkled a teaspoon of sugar on my grapefruit and made my teeth rotten as a result, I must remember it was his granddad who planted South Africa's white gold. And I must tell my dad there was always a bunny chow waiting for him in my establishment. 
I nodded and pretended to be interested, but I was really looking at Melissa, who was holding AJ's hand under the table. If this was love, it was forbidden love. Even I knew that. Everyone in the cafe knew that. Politics had found its way into grapefruits and into holding hands. I mean, if Orwell's intention was, as he has stated, to make political writing more into a form of art, Levy certainly raised that sentiment to a new bar. Uh, by adding a more em emotional and personal touch to Orwell's mostly political commentary, Levy both points out the differences in approaches to political writing between women and men, as well as expands upon Orwell's ideas about ideology in a more relatable manner. Um, both works are really just fantastic, although Levy's is a little bit quicker to read. Um, both bring into a lot into consideration, uh, especially for those interested in reading and writing about politics as well as feminism. So if you've read these, uh, let me know in the comment section whatever you loved and hated about them. Uh, and if you enjoyed this review, you know, I'd love to do more, whether it's stuff like this, uh, or fantasy, or, you know, again, as I said, horror, <laughs> or pretty much anything, you know, you can come up with. Uh, really genuinely trying to get back into the habit for good, because I, I do find that the more time I spend reading, the more different perspectives I can get from people that I don't think I would even get to talk to under normal circumstances. I mean, definitely, you know, dead authors. From that, just kind of, you know, keep working on my perspective of myself and the world I live in, and maybe even find out ways I can continuously work to make both better. So thanks for watching this video, and I hope to have more like it very, very soon.